Welcome to the second part of our conversation with singer, songwriter, educator, composer, and associate professor at Senior College of City University of New York, Lehman College, Michael Bacon. Our first conversation took us to discuss new hobbies, lockdowns, the Bacon Brothers, the musical education of Professor Bacon. In the first part, he mentioned living in Nashville, Tennessee for 10 years since 1972. So naturally, I move on to ask about influence Nashville had on his composing. Boy, did it ever. Um, Nashville is a songwriter's town. There is no place in the world like it. Songwriters are the kings and queens. They fuel the entire industry of country music. Not in New York, not in L.A., not in San Francisco, not in Chicago, not in Philly. Those are production centers. So when you think of Motown, you think of the players and, the, and of course, their wonderful songs. But in Nashville, it's just about the songs. So um, I thought I was a pretty good songwriter. This is uh, 1972. And my wife and I got married in 1972 and I stayed, rented a U-Haul and drove down to Nashville, uh, rented an apartment. And I started as a staff songwriter at Combine Music, which when I tell people about this now in Nashville, it, Combine Music was um, legendary. Apps, I mean, that Roy Orbison, had Chris Christopherson, I mean, just all these huge, huge hits and songwriters, not not people that are going out with a bit with a twenty piece band. They're talking about chinga 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 chinga. Take the ribbon from your hair, ching ching. And all of a sudden, I mean, Chris Christopherson is not a great singer; can barely play the guitar, but he was writing these songs that had nothing to do with how they were produced or who sang them. They were just pure genius songs. And so my wife and I go down to Nashville and uh, we go to this place called the Exit Inn, which is still open. And one of the things that's huge in Nashville because it's a songwriter's town are writer's nights. And like I think Tuesday night of the Exit Inn in those days were writer's nights where uh, you would book about four or five songwriters, just guitar, maybe, you know, singing with piano or guitar. That was it. And everybody would sing four songs. And now that's evolved. It's become much more, like the Bluebird Cafe is world famous for that exact thing. But it's very structured and it's kind of a little bit on the touristy side. But um, Exit in Songwriters Night was, it was the real thing. And at that time, Nashville was not the type of town it is now. It was a kind of a little country town. The um, number one industry was religious publishing, and the other was life insurance. So in the Grand Old Opry, um, W, kind of spacing out the call letters of the Grand Old Opry, sorry. Um, life and Casualty, LAC, WLAC, you know, it was all... And the, the music industry was number three, and I'm sure that's changed now. So anyway, my wife and I go to the exit inn, and this guy gets up there with a cowboy hat named Guy Clark. And he sings four songs and pinned me to my seat. Just my jaw dropped. And I was like, that's, we're going back to Pennsylvania. I, I, I don't belong here. This is... Um, so that night, my reverence for the purity of Nashville songwriting exploded and hasn't changed. And I'm not saying when I listen to country music, I like all the songs. Mostly I don't like all the songs, but every once in a while, you'll hear a song that just pins you to your chair. And it's generally not the singer and not the arrangement and not the groove. It's this pure beautiful, beautiful song that comes out of, to me, most of the time out of Nashville. So um, I was there for, I had two records on Monument Label, which is another legendary label. Uh, Roy Orbison was on that, and 
uh, Fred Foster, who owned both Combine Music and Monument Records, signed me to two record deals. So, um, but I wasn't, I never actually, I had some covers. I had, you know, Jerry Lee Lewis covered one of my songs. A bunch of people covered the songs, but they weren't hits. So when the Bob Beck and the publisher, after eight or ten years, looked at the bottom line of what I was producing, what I was getting paid, I think I got up to $100 a week at some point, uh, then he ended the contract and my wife and I said, let's go back, you know, uh, back to New York. And, uh, you know, I, I really missed the East Coast, but uh, just a very long way of answering your question that it was enormous influence on me in terms of my songwriting. And um, the other thing that's really cool about Nashville is the the studio players are absolute legends. Um, my first exposure to that was when Johnny Cash had a television show that was very, very popular. And um, he invited Bob Dylan to come on the show. And that was groundbreaking because, you know, people think we're divided as a nation now. We were way more divided back then. There was a the Vietnam War. There was the hippies, or the, the, the construction workers. You know, if you had long hair, you could get beat up. Or if you had crew cut, you could get beat up by the long hairs. It was a very bad time. And most people that I interact with are too young to remember it, but I was there. It was horrible. Um, but the fact that Johnny Cash invited this crazy Greenwich Village hippie onto his show was, he, it just had never been done before. So um, Dylan kind of got exposed to the whole Nashville thing that none of us in the East Coast really knew much about at all. I mean, I knew Chet Atkins and, and uh, uh, Jimmy Rogers and, and that kind of thing, but I didn't really know. I, it was kind of a genre of country music that really wasn't even heard in the, in the East Coast. So um, I started to get really interested when Nashville Skyline came out, where Dylan went down there and, and hung out with all the great studio players who nobody knew about. They knew about them in, in Oklahoma and Alabama, but they didn't know about them in New York and Philly. And um, so I decided uh, I was tired of, I was living in Philadelphia. I was, you know, I just didn't feel like I, w I had been in a band that was very popular. We broke up. I went on my own almost immediately. So we went to Nashville for a new start. And um, I had the record deal. So I had my pick of all the great Nashville players. And one thing that's really interesting that differentiates any studio player in New York with Nashville is nobody reads music in Nashville. They use a really a Baroque system of numbers. So one, four, five, two minor, three minor, six minor. Um, and the reason that they do that uh, is that if a singer comes in and the band is rehearsing the song in G, and all of a sudden the singer says, oh, let's take it down to F sharp, then instead of G being the one, F sharp is the one, and you don't have to write a new chart. If you're talking about letters, then you actually would have to write a whole new chart unless you can transpose, which is another thing your brain has to go through. So the, um, the, the Nashville studio system was completely different than New York and Philadelphia. Uh, it was very spontaneous. It was recording sessions were kind of a party. Um, and, uh, I just got to know so many amazing, some of them are still my friends for all these years later, uh, from Nashville. And again, respecting something that was not a trained academic kind of environment. It was completely different than that. Um, and also going back to the publishing company, the publishing company had a 24 track studio in the basement. And if you wrote a song, I'm going to book the the studio for 11 o'clock tomorrow. I want to cut two songs. What players do you want? Kenny Buttrick, Dave Briggs, uh, Reggie Young, anybody you want. Because those players knew Combine was a very hot place. And if all of a sudden you're working with a very young writer and they become the next Chris Christopherson, you're going to be pulled along with them. So it was, it was a great creative situation and really, really challenging. And I made a lot of really good friends and learned an enormous amount about songwriting. And my wife, um, 
got her teaching degree from Vanderbilt and uh, taught in the Nashville Public Schools for several years. And as I said, once the disco, we moved back to Pennsylvania in the disco era, she supported our family for several years where I was making, uh, you know, I had a, I had a station wagon with a PA system and I was playing in colleges and high schools and spending more in gas than I was making for the fees. So we survived. Wow. You pinned me to my seat with that story, Professor. Thank you. <laughs> I wanted to talk about classical music uh, and the composers that inspire you because classical music is very close to me. Uh, for example, I read a lot and I was adopting this book last summer and uh, I found myself being unable to switch from Dvorak to some other composer. It will just stop me from being able to write. Uh, so I wanted to ask, does anything similar ever happens to you? Or maybe you have a single composer that you reach out to to listen when you're in a certain mood. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think everybody's got to step up and say who their number one is. And it's got to be Stravinsky for me. Um, just because of the range uh, and the fluidity for so many years that he went through and was able to change and morph and develop. Um, uh, you know, when you think of um, Rite of Spring uh, and how groundbreaking that was, um, and then the, the gorgeous melodies of uh, some of his, sometimes I, I draw a blank, but... Um, yeah, to me, he's he's a little bit like John Corleano. He kind of does it all. He can write the most heartbreakingly beautiful things and the most terrifying, gut-wrenching horrors. Uh, and to me, that range is, if, you know, I would like to be a composer who had an enormous amount of range. Um, so I guess I would, I, would, I would do that. Of course, I love the... Um, the Vorjak just because the you know, I love anybody that wrote a cello concerto because I wrote a cello concerto uh, and um, that's my passion now um, and writing you know one of the things that's really difficult I think we need to come up with a new word for classical music and I, I tend to use art music but that's not really right either because I'm sort of trained now that when I think of classical music I think of 1750 1825 and then is a lot of people would de describe Stravinsky as classical music. So it's kind of a weird thing. So, um, yeah, when I wrote the cello concerto, um, one of the things that's, it's, it's difficult as somebody who does a lot of different things is as consumers of music, we like to put people in boxes. Just give you a quick example. Um, I'm in a band with my brother, the Bacon Brothers, with, you know, a world famous movie star. And people do not accept, well, I'm going to say, most people are very resistant. And when I say to people, well, my brother is one of my fav most favorite songwriters and has no musical training, but has an, an incredible gift that I don't have uh, to capture feelings and, and situations and turn them into a really great song. And people are going, oh, yeah, right. Yeah, he's footloose and he's a great songwriter. So um, when I wrote the cello concerto, I know that people are probably rolling their eyes and say, well, you're a film composer. Is this going to be a bunch of your your American experience uh, historical theme? It's not. It's The cello concerto has nothing to do with what I do as a film composer. Film composing is a craft. It's not an art. Film composing, the music is not there for its own sake. It's there to support a larger work of art, which is the actual film. And I encourage uh, my students to find some kind of a separation. And uh, when I graduated from Lehman in the 90s, I did my final, it was a brass quintet, which was my final piece for graduation and we had them all and it was it was so horrible I mean I, I just was so embarrassed um, I hated it it was written from some kind of an academic place that was not me 
Uh, and at that point, I decided I will never be an, an art composer. I just, I don't have it. In the same way I wasn't a jingle composer. I, I just don't have that. So um, finally, I wrote this first movement of my cello concerto and worked on it for 10 years. And then the next three movements, actually the next two movements came very quickly. And I played a, um, a mock-up for John Corleano, and he said, I, I think this is really nice, but you need a fourth movement. So I wrote a fourth movement. Um, so this is my thing that I can keep separate from my film scoring and from my songwriting and from my performing in the band. And um, that way I don't end in a in a state of frustration of... What am I doing with my life? You know, I know I have that thing. I've had one performance, hugely successful. I had another one before in the Oklahoma City before COVID hit, which is going to come back. So um, I think I've had students over the years, and some of them are fantastic composers, yet I know they could never make it as a film composer because they just don't really want to hear about the revisions and the fact that their music is not the point. And I wouldn't say that to them, but I can tell the first time a client is saying, uh, can you rewrite that? They're going to say, no, I don't want to. It's perfect. And you can't be that kind of person. You have to be very collaborative. You have to be very open. You have to swallow hard when you hear visions. You have to listen to people describing other pieces of music as being wonderful when you know that they're not. Uh, you know, I hear a lot of music. It sounds like it was written by a kindergarten person not that there's anything wrong with composers in kindergarten but the the stuff sometimes i feel like saying to the to the client if you like that i'll teach you how to write that in a half an hour and you can just write it yourself it'll you'll it'll be yours you'll own that because it's not hard it's just anyway i love that you have stirred our conversation straight into the film scoring because it leads me right into my next question as a filmmaker in the making, I wanted to ask uh, about your take to deal with your clients, the movie directors who has maybe difficult attitude or was difficult to maybe find a common ground or perhaps they would demand something that is absurd. When you can't just deny them what they want and just tell them to go away, what's the best way to deal with that sort of situation? Well, I'm just good at that. You know, I guess the fact that I'm one of six children in that little skinny townhouse in Philadelphia, maybe, you know, we all had to kind of get along. Um, I've learned everything that I know about film scoring. And now I'm a college professor in two colleges, so I'm, I learned something. Um, and I learned it from people who don't know anything about music. But everybody knows about music in terms of... No, you know, just because you're trained doesn't mean you know more than someone else. And if you're a director and you're looking for a certain kind of music, which is generally the last gas before music is the last thing you have to save your film. They think that at least. So I listen to this stuff and the fact that I've been doing it for so long. No director is ever going to say anything to me I haven't heard before and haven't figured out how to solve it. So it, with experience, um, you just learn how to be a person who can understand what people are looking for and at least provide them something close. And the lovely thing about today's film composition is when we do our mock-ups, which are the um, like sketches, of this is what I'm thinking for this piece, you can make it 75% of what it would be in the end, even including if it's a full orchestra. So you get a lot more opportunity to talk about your piece of music rather than some other piece of abstract music somewhere else. So, um, you know, it, it just gets easier over the years um, because you've, you've sort of run into, I'll, I'll give you an example. I have this, have this wonderful client who's since passed away uh, named Charlie Guggenheim was one, I don't know, he's, he won 10 Academy Awards. He was a documentarian. He just owned Academy Awards in the documentary field. Um, and we were doing this piece where he, he had a helicopter shot, not a drone, there weren't drones in those days, 
and the helicopter shot came down and then up over a hill and then revealed this beautiful mansion of which the film was about. So I wrote this really nice piece of a helicopter flying over the beautiful hills of Vermont it was. And when I played it, he said, you're flattening the picture. I said, what? He said, you're flattening the picture. I said, what does that mean? I have no idea what that means. But now I know what it means. It means that the helicopter was going like this up, over, and reveal. And the music had to paint that mm -hmm. for him. And it didn't matter what went before it was appropriate. If I weren't taking that moment that he spent a lot of money on a helicopter shot, I was flattening the picture. Now, there's a real different way of saying that, saying, well, I really want when I, I want the music to, to kind of crescendo and um, be on an upward trajectory melodically until the top of the hill. And then I want it. And now that should be a dominant seventh chord. And then right as the house is revealed, I want the tonic. You know, that's the way he could have said that. Um, but now I know if someone says flat in the picture, I know what that means. And I will say that in terms of that description I just gave, you don't want your clients to talk to you in musical terms. Like I once had a, a, a client I was working for, and he said, well, why don't you try a ninth chord there? And first of all, did he meet a major ninth? or a dominant ninth, I, you know, it, I don't even know, but it, it's when directors want to kind of move into your world of music and give you technical ideas, it's, it's, that's very off-putting and makes me really nervous because then you feel like this is a director who kind of really wants to write the music themselves and maybe subconsciously feels like they can do a better job than you can. So, but, it, but the, the other thing I'll say about that is what you really want from your client is specificity. This doesn't work here. This works there. Uh, this needs to change here. This is too full. This is too empty. This is too. This is too harsh. This is too melodic. You know, as long as they are really specific, then you're you're in good shape because you can make those musical adjustments very easily because of, you know you have technique and. It, but if they try to speak in musical terms, that often throws the whole thing really off off base. I'm going to ask you uh, my last question. For someone who plays nine instruments, this might be tough to answer. If you will be forced to play a single instrument for the rest of your life, which one would it be? <laughs> I love that you're choosing cello. Not even, not even a question. Not even a question. I mean, it's the most this amazing. This is so amazing. Because I uh, can only play the one, uh, only piano, but if I will be forced to listen to only one single instrument for the rest of my life, I'm going to choose cello for sure. It's tuned into my heart somehow. I don't know. Well, great somehow. minds think alike, obviously. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's, well, first of all, it's the, this is... Uh, that's the lowest voice most men can sing, and then it goes all the way, way into the soprano range. Uh, it has four strings, it's a guitar, it's a bass. Um, it can break your heart, it can scare you to death. Um, yeah, it's just, it's just, I'm so lucky that, you know, and the, th the thing with me and the instruments is I'm a little bit like, I'm sure, you, sure you've met someone who is a, not a great athlete, but like a good athlete. And you throw them a football, they've never seen a football, boom, spiral. Uh, you throw them a baseball, um, a hockey puck, um, a basketball, a tennis ball. They just, you throw them a ball and they can do something. And that's the way I am with instruments. I don't play any of them really well. Um, I play a lot of cello on my scores, but I'm playing my own parts. I'm not reading somebody else's parts. So, um, when I pick up an instrument, I can figure it out. I just have that ability. And it doesn't mean I'm a good at it, virtuoso, but it's just something very, very comfortable for me. And I'm well suited to film scoring because one of the things I love to do is just grab some goo, like, 
is a cigar box guitar. And it's just like, you know, I mean, I can just do that. It's not that great, but I know how to make it sound musical. So that's, you know, that's a, um, that's a skill I have. Thank God. Thank you, Professor, uh, truly, for your inspiring stories, for being my first guest. This is 12 Hours to the Future with my recent cheer. Until next time. 12 Hours in the Future is produced by Jim Carney, Maria Sanchir, and we had technical help from Eve Dussou. Special thanks to Professor Tom O'Hanlon and Dean James Mann. The executive producer and host of 12 Hours in the Future is Maria Sanchir. 12 Hours in the Future with Maria Sanchir is a series of conversations recorded simultaneously in Ulaanbaatar, Mongolia, and around the world by the Bronx Journal Radio through the resources of Lehman College, City University of New York. You can reach us at info at 12hoursinthefuture.com. We're on Instagram and YouTube. Or you can find us wherever you get your podcasts. This show is protected under international copyright and may not be recorded or retransmitted without written consent. Until next time, when we see you 12 hours in the future.